So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to tell you about uh, the results of some of our recent work on uh, research we've done trying to identify the underlying causes of stuttering. And uh, we have some exciting new results to present today, which uh, I hope to be able to explain in relatively non-scientific terms. So uh, the, the mystery of the underlying causes of this disorder have been with us for centuries. And while many, many hypotheses have been generated, people had all sorts of ideas, really very many good ideas um, about what causes this disorder, uh, in the end, we really haven't been able to successfully identify any of the underlying causes of the disorder, although it's clear we know a lot of things that will, for instance, make stuttering worse or it temporarily improve fluency. But the underlying original cause of the disorder has remained a mystery. However, what has become clear over a number of years is that genetic factors in this disorder clearly play some sort of role. And that evidence comes from several different sources. Uh, one is uh, twin studies. Uh, twin studies produce estimates of what we call heritability, which is uh, loosely put, how genetic is it? Okay? So many things cluster in families, uh, but it's not clear that they do so because of genetics or because of environment or because of something else. Uh, so there are a number of ways us geneticists have of answering that question. And those studies produce these sorts of heritability estimates. And there have been uh, a total of five twin studies of stuttering that have been published that I know of. Uh, they uh, differ greatly in uh, how big they are and uh, what sort of diagnostic criteria were used for stuttering and a variety of other aspects. Uh, but they all tend to produce fairly consistent results, which is that something like 50 to 70 percent of uh, what we call the liability for the disorder seems to come from genes. So that is considered fairly high. Just to give you, uh, to put that into perspective, for instance, your cholesterol level is determined by both your genes and your diet. Uh, the heritability of your cholesterol level is about 30 percent. Okay, so this is a fairly substantial heritability. Uh, there have been other studies that have been done to address this question. Adoption studies are uh, frequently used. Now, there have been two adoption studies of stuttering, both of them too small to draw any clear scientific conclusions. But both of them were really quite suggestive that uh, there's really no evidence that children s learn to stutter by listening to stuttering parents. Uh, so, for instance, one of these studies showed that adopted children who uh, are not biologically related to stuttering parents have no higher frequency of stuttering than the general public. Okay? So, probably not learned by listening to other people in the house who stutter. Uh, there are a few family clusters of this disorder. Uh, a lot of small families, uh, sort of what we call nuclear families, which is parents and offspring. Um, and a few very large families have been described, uh, and some of them studied fairly extensively. Of course, these uh, per se don't really address the question of heritability because uh, they could come from shared environment, shared family environment. Uh, so what people do is they do something called segregation analysis, which is uh, a way of looking at how the disorder occurs in families. And if it's genetic, it's going to occur in a very particular identifiable pattern. And uh, these sorts of studies are used to, for instance, determine if there is a single major gene at work in, in families. Uh, they can determine the, what's called the mode of inheritance of the disorder in a family because there are different modes of inheritance. And I should say that a number of segregation analyses of stuttering have been performed and they have not been very conclusive. Uh, some studies have shown evidence for a single major gene effect and others have been unable to demonstrate any such evidence. Uh, some have suggested that there, it, there might be what's called an autosomal dominant in a few families, but other studies have been unable to confirm this. So let's just say that while it's clear that there's genetic factors that underlie this disorder, exactly what these genetic factors are and how they manifest themselves in families is much less clear. So the formal genetics of this disorder have been very murky. So uh, what is our plan? Well, our plan was to begin with something called genetic linkage studies. 
These studies are applicable to any inherited disorder. They are, in, importantly, agnostic with respect to disease mechanism. You don't have to know anything about the underlying uh, pathology or biochemistry or physiology of the disease. You just need to know that's in it, it, that it is inherited. And due to the power of genetics, you can ultimately find the genes that cause it. Okay? Um, so uh, what linkage studies do is they identify the location of the gene or genes that cause the disorder, and they are performed in families. Okay? So uh, we and others have done a number of genetic linkage studies of stuttering. Uh, and for instance, one of the first we did is one we call the North American Linkage Study. We enrolled 70 modest-sized nuclear families, typically parents and children, but sometimes we'd have an uncle uh, or occasionally a grandparent. Um, and we found weak evidence of linkage, that is, uh, the presumptive location of a causative gene on chromosome 18. However, this did not reach statistical significance. Uh, and so while it was suggestive, the only real conclusion we could make from this study was that there is no single common gene that causes stuttering in the general North American population. Because if there were, we would have seen it in this study. So um, our results uh, were then mirrored by the results of a number of other research groups who undertook genetic linkage studies of stuttering in other populations. Uh, and the combined conclusion of this was really quite similar. Uh, these studies in toto uh, found suggestive evidence for linkage on chromosomes 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, 12, 13, 15, and 21. Uh, however, none of these reached uh, statistical significance in a simple, any sort of simple genetic analysis. They were, by and large, suggestive. So this, it turns out, came at a time when linkage studies were being applied to all sorts of disorders that tend to run in families. Uh, everything from asthma to osteoporosis to psychiatric disease to diabetes, you name it. Uh, all of these disorders have substantial heritability. Uh, and people undertook large-scale linkage studies with lots of families and began to see just the same kinds of results. Uh, so these things were generally characterized by weak statistical support for the findings. Lots of suggestive linkage, but not very much statistically significant. It didn't quite get over the bar. Uh, failures to replicate. Uh, people, one group would find a linkage to a disorder in a particular place on a particular chromosome. No one else could find a linkage at that location in their group of families. So this uh, was helpful and I think encouraging, but really these results were not the kind of results that would allow people to move to the next step and, under, and identify the underlying disease genes at any of these locations. Okay? So uh, what's the solution to this problem? Well, there have been many suggested solutions. Um, we chose a, a fairly unique solution, uh, which is to look in specialized populations uh, for linkage studies of this disorder. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking mostly about one such population today, uh, which is uh, the population of Pakistan. So uh, Pakistan is a particularly advantageous population for doing genetic studies. 70% uh, of all marriages in Pakistan are between either first or second cousins, and this marriage pattern has persisted over centuries. Uh, this results in a population structure with a greatly increased incidence of genetic disorders. And these, this was well recognized for simple inherited medical disorders, simple medical genetic disorders, many of which are very rare, uh, but some of which are not so rare, things like inherited deafness or inherited blindness. Um, but what wasn't fully appreciated was that the same populations might actually give us a leg up on finding these more complex genetic traits, like stuttering. Because of the intermarriage, it helps bring out these genetic effects in families. All right? So these may help strengthen linkage studies of complex disorders like stuttering. So uh, we set off to do this. Uh, 
we collaborated with a really outstanding group uh, at the National Center of Excellence in Molecular Biology at the University of Punjab in Lahore. Uh, there are not significant stuttering therapy programs available in Pakistan, so we went to the schools uh, and, and sought families there. We initially identified 100 families and chose 44 of them for our linkage study. And the results, uh, oh, I should say, uh, some of these families can be quite remarkable in, in their structure. Uh, scientists like to, to put some data up in a slide and say typical results are shown. And what they mean is the best results are shown. So here is really, uh, I, this is not really a typical family. Um, but this family, PKST72, is a family I'm going to talk about a lot as I go through in this talk. And I'll just show you the structure of it to give you an idea how intermarried these families are. Here are two brothers and a sister who married two sisters and a brother that were offspring of their first cousin. Okay? Uh, the squares are the boys, the circles are the girls, uh, the filled in figures are the people who are affected. You see most of the affected are boys in this family, which is typical of what we see in the general stuttering population, although there are a few girls. Uh, in addition, there are some intermarriages that we just don't have very well characterized. So this person, for instance, is somehow related to this person, but we can't really connect her back. We just don't know how, because it's sort of lost in the family history. So there's a great deal of intermarriage in these families. And um, so uh, in these 44 families, we performed a linkage study which involves testing genetic markers up and down the lengths of all the human chromosomes until you find co-inheritance. And that's called linkage. Uh, you find co-inheritance of a marker with stuttering in the family. And linkage occurs because that marker resides so close to the gene that causes the trait that it is not susceptible to the normal mixing processes that all chromosomes undergo as they're passed from parent to offspring. Okay? So if you see linkage and you know the location of the marker, that displays linkage with the disorder in the family, you know the approximate location of the gene that causes the disorder in that family. All right? So we got a whopping linkage hit here on chromosome 12. Um, it uh, was uh, profoundly statistically significant, and it was clear there was a single major gene effect causing stuttering in this population. Uh, and the, the largest single amount of evidence for which came from that family, PKST72. So what was our strategy to find this gene on chromosome 12? Well, we, uh, we basically analyzed this region in, in a great uh, uh, deal of detail. There are 87 known and predicted genes within this region. Uh, to give you some idea of the scale of the task, uh, DNA, which is what is uh, the substance of the genes that resides in our chromosomes, is a very long molecule uh, that basically specifies the genetic code. Uh, and it's a series of letters, which are actually called bases. Uh, and a typical gene might be a few thousand bases long. Okay? This region on chromosome 12 containing these genes was 10 million bases long. And we were looking for a single base that was different in people who stuttered compared to normals. So this was an extreme needle in the haystack problem. And it really was solved by the heroic efforts of a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Uh, his name is Cheng Su Kang. Uh, and he uh, really basically bludgeoned this problem <laughs> into submission. Uh, so we found a very large number of genetic variants in 10 million bases. I mean, all of us have a great deal of differences in our DNA. It's what makes us different from each other. Uh, the question is, which one causes stuttering? Well, we came upon, ultimately, uh, what we call the variant of interest. Uh, this variant showed the highest degree of co-segregation with stuttering in family PKST72 and did not appear in the normal Pakistani population. So the vast majority of our variants that we found in that stuttering family also occurred just in all Pakistanis. So they were unlikely to be the causative variant. Uh, this variant uh, was an apparent mutation in a gene called GNPTAB, which I'm going to talk a lot more about. This mu uh, mutation substitutes the amino acid lysine in place of the normal amino acid glutamic acid in the gene product. So genes are uh, composed of DNA, and they're a code uh, that is read out. Uh, and that, that code specifies 
uh, amino acids, which make up proteins. So there are four letters of code in the DNA, and there are 20 different proteins. So those proteins go together in long, uh, those amino acids go together in long chains, and they make up proteins. And proteins are what provide the structures in our body, for instance, the lens of our eye or cartilage, um, and the functions. They make up all the enzymes that run all the reactions that make everything work in our, in our bodies. So uh, at amino acid position 1200, this glutamic acid was replaced by a lysine. I should tell you, this gene occurs in almost all higher organisms, all right? This is an evolutionarily ancient gene. Uh, and at this position, at position 1200, in all mammals, in birds, in fish, uh, actually all the way down to slime molds is a glutamic acid. So nature has decided it wants this a lot. Uh, and uh, that was actually the fact that this is something quite different uh, was one of the first pieces of evidence that this maybe is the, is the thing we're looking for. Uh, so what is its association with stuttering, this particular mutation? Well, the exact same mutation occurred in a number of these other stuttering families that we used to do the original linkage study. So we found it in Pakistani stuttering family 5, 25, and 41. There's a total of four, four out of 41 families. Suggests that perhaps, if this is the causative mutation, it could account for as much as 10% of stuttering families in Pakistan. The same mutation, the exact same lysine mutation, occurred in unrelated affected individuals from Pakistan and India. So these aren't part of any family. These are people we just found in the population who stutter. And some of these people have this same mutation. Uh, we did find this mutation once in our normal control group. And that might be what you would expect. I mean, these are, were a group of people whose speech was normal as adults. But you would expect once in a great while that perhaps one of them might have stuttered as a child and recovered, uh, and that's all been forgotten. Uh, so we never found it in a group, a large group of normal uh, controls from North America. Uh, this was an extremely well characterized, neurologically characterized group of subjects that were actually enrolled in a previous study for Parkinson's disease. So they had a full neurologic workup, and we never found the mutation in any of them. Uh, so what is the traditional hallmark that you know you found your gene? Well, the traditional hallmark is you find, if that's the gene, you find different mutations in that gene in different families that have the same disorder. Okay? So when we started going to the general population looking for other mutations in this gene, we promptly found some. Uh, we found... Um, Another several mutations in people from not only South Asia, India, and Pakistan, but also Europeans. All of them altered amino acids that were the same in all vertebrate animals, and none of them were ever observed in any normal controls. So uh, this is now looking really quite, quite promising. Um, so let me just take a moment here to tell you a little bit about what this gene is and what it does. So this encodes part of an enzyme that resides in the cells in our body. Uh, and the enzyme has a long name. It's called glycnac phosphotransferase. But I'll just tell you, it's pretty simple. What this enzyme does is move a phosphorus from one thing to another. It's a phosphotransferase, OK? And I'll tell you more about why that's important. Uh, this is an enzyme involved in the normal metabolism of all cells, as far as we can tell at this point. Uh, this gene uh, makes a protein uh, that's processed, so it turns into an alpha and a beta what do we call alpha and beta subunits. And this is the part of this enzyme that actually does the reaction, performs this chemical reaction of moving a phosphorus to another. That's what we call the catalytic subunits. But this enzyme has another piece to it, and it's encoded by another gene. And that gene is called GNPTG. And it encodes the recognition subunit of this enzyme. So what does it transfer the, phos the phosphorus from and to? is specified by this part of the enzyme, encoded by another gene. We started looking in this gene uh, in, for mutations in people who stutter, and right away we began to find them. Um, we found a number of different mutations in uh, unrelated affected individuals. All of these affect uh, the positions in this gene that were highly conserved, so nature decides it really wants that. Uh, none of them were ever observed in any normal subjects. Okay, so. Um, this enzyme, GNPTAB slash G, is the catalytic and recognition subunits of this enzyme, glycnac phosphotransferase. 
what this does is it attaches initially glicnac phosphate to enzymes that are destined to reside in the cell's recycling bin. This is a special place inside the cell known as the lysosome. And it participates in the normal degradation of, of parts of the cell that's part of the normal turnover of all things in our cells that goes on all the time. Okay? And it's easy to imagine why these might have to be put in a special place. Because you don't want them just attacking uh, parts of the cell willy-nilly. Uh, that would be very destructive. So the cell has to find a particular place to do this. And that place is called the lysosome. Okay? Um, so this enzyme performs the first step in something called the lysosomal targeting pathway, which is responsible for directing actually a lot of enzymes, about 60. 60 different enzymes to the lysosome. So in order to do all of this recycling, the cell needs a lot of enzymes in this thing. And this enzyme is what gets those, all those other enzymes to the lysosome. Okay? Uh, here's a kind of a complicated diagram, but I just wanted to show you. Uh, this green thing here is any one of these 60 enzymes. And these things typically have sugar molecules attached to them, uh, complex sugars. Uh, glicnac is an abbreviation for a complex sugar. Uh, if you tasted glicnac, it wouldn't taste sweet to you. Uh, however, at the ends of these glicnac, they put mannose residues. And if you taste mannose, it's like glucose or fructose or sucrose. Uh, it would actually it will taste sweet. It's a simple sugar. And this enzyme, this phosphotransferase, takes this complicated donor and clips it in half, these two yellow phosphates here, phosphorus molecules, and sticks half of it onto the end of these mannoses and, and leaves this other half. And now there's a second enzyme that finishes the job. And it has the abbreviation NAGPA, but everyone in the business just calls it the uncovering enzyme. And the reason it's called the uncovering enzyme is because it clips off this last glicnac and uncovers this phosphorus attached to a mannose. Okay? So uh, mannose is, has a six carbon sugar, and at carbon number six, this phosphate is on. So this in the circle here is something recognized. It's the signal recognized by something called the mannose 6-phosphate receptor inside cells. It's very well characterized. Uh, and this is the signal that tells the cell that this enzyme, whatever it is, has to go through some other compartments of the cell and end up in the lysosome. OK? So um, what about mutations in the uncovering enzyme? So uh, this performs, as I say, the next step in this targeting pathway. And as soon as we started sequencing this in people who stutter, we began to find mutations. Uh, we found three different mutations so far. Uh, one of them was repeated three times, actually. So this may be, there may be one common mutation in the uncovering enzyme. Uh, all of these people happen to be of European descent, at least so far. Uh, all of these mutations affect conserved amino acids and were never found in any normal controls. So. Um, where does this leave us in the world of medical genetics? Well, uh, it actually puts us in a very well-known place in medical genetics because mutations in this, these two genes are already very well known in some very rare medical disorders called mucolipidosis types 2 and 3, ML2 and ML3. ML2 is a very severe disorder. It is typically diagnosed at birth. It is uniformly fatal in the first decade of life. It's a horrible, tragic disease. Uh, ML3 is sort of the mild form of that disease. Um, uh, it is typically, um, typically people live into young adulthood, although it's very variable. Um, both of these diseases are what we call, uh, are very rare what we call lysosomal storage disorders with primary deficits, pathology, uh, displayed in the skeletal system, the joints, the brain, the liver, and the spleen. And when I say rare, I mean extremely rare. They're probably alive in the United States today. Uh, it's not well characterized, but I would guess fewer than 20 people with these disorders. So it's, these are extremely rare disorders, but very well studied um, from a biochemical point of view and from a medical point of view, because they're very striking. Uh, and it's clear they're uh, uh, part of a large collection of disorders called lysosomal storage disorders. Uh, those 60 enzymes that go in the lysosome to do all that recycling? Well, you could have a mutation in any one of those 60 genes. And when you do, you will get a lysosomal storage disease. Uh, 
Uh, most of them are very rare, and people might not have heard of them. One of the most famous is a disease called Tay-Sachs disease. That's a lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, Gaucher disease is another one. Um, so these, these are not mutations in one of the enzymes that actually does the recycling. They're mutations in the system that gets all the enzymes to their proper location. Okay. So I talked about mutations in the phosphotransferase, and that they lead to mucolipidosis. What about mutations in the uncovering enzyme? Well, no human disorder has ever been associated with mutations in the uncovering enzyme. Uh, and actually, this has been a big surprise and a long-standing puzzle in medical genetics, because these people might be expected to have medical symptoms similar to those in ML2 and ML3. I mean, it's part of the same process. And uh, so people have often asked, well, where's the disease caused by mutations in this enzyme? This is a well-known enzyme. It's very well studied. And uh, we think we found the answer to that question. We think the answer is uh, the disorder caused by mutations in the uncovering enzyme is stuttering. Okay. Uh, so where does this leave us? Well, mutations in these three genes may account for something like 5 to 10 percent of familial stuttering worldwide, uh, and that would correspond to stuttering in something in excess of 100,000 individuals in the United States. So to now take a step back and uh, sort of look at the big picture, what does this mean? Well, first of all, it means that these so-called lysosomal targeting disorders are clearly no longer rare. This, this isn't 10 or 20 people in the United States. This is tens of thousands of people in the United States, and probably many, many thousands more worldwide, we think. Um, the second thing is, is that uh, it indicates the stuttering now overlaps the field of medicine, because this is a very well-characterized area of medical genetics. Uh, and then the last thing I'll, I'll mention is a very uh, speculative, but I think potentially exciting prospect. In general, inherited disorders don't have very many good treatments for them. Of the several thousand simple inherited medical disorders in humans, most of them have no cure. Most of them don't even have a very good treatment. However, the lysosomal storage disorders are proving to be an exception. So in the last 10 years, very exciting medical therapy has de been developed for lysosomal storage disorders, and it involves giving the enzyme back to these people. And there have been a number of very successful uh, therapeutics developed for a whole variety of these lysosomal storage disorders. So there are many hurdles that would have to be overcome before enzyme replacement therapy could be seen as a viable therapy for stuttering in this group of people who stutter. Nonetheless, those hurdles are very actively being worked on by all sorts of labs um, uh, run by very talented people. Uh, and these Problems are being overcome at a rapid rate, and so I think while this might take a long time, uh, it's very exciting potential therapeutic pros uh, prospect. So people in the field of medicine frequently say, well, how do you know you just, you just haven't found, you, you're not just diagnosing cases of mucolipidosis? Maybe mucolipidosis is much more common than we think it is, and really, you're just seeing the little tip of the iceberg with these people who stutter. So we were able to take advantage of the very impressive clinical resources at the National Institutes of Health and bring some of these people in for very uh, extensive medical evaluations. So far, we've been able to bring four of them into the NIH Clinical Center. Uh, and one thing is very clear, that no symptoms of mucolipidosis were observed in any of these individuals, and in particular, uh, other than stuttering, all four individuals were completely neurologically normal, and we did everything. <laughs> so uh, the answer to this question appears to be no. Uh, and in fact, there are some good, uh, some good theoretical and scientific reasons why you would expect the answer to be no, uh, but we haven't confirmed any of that with any data yet, but we're working on it. Um, so. What, um, what do we feel are the implications for speech-language pathology at this point? Well, uh, there are a number of things I have to say. The first is that our results explain only a small fraction of stuttering. The uh, second thing is, uh, well, what, what, what might this do today? Well, from a research perspective, it would allow us now to start asking questions, for instance, about therapy. So a good question might be, 
Could underlying genetic differences explain differences in therapy outcomes? Well, you couldn't ask this question until you actually had some of these genetic differences to test. So we now have them, and one could imagine actually asking this kind of question. Uh, and finally, I would like to say that our results suggest a coming partnership between speech-language pathologists and physicians. I would say that an analogous model might be uh, the relationship between otolaryngologists and audiologists which is a very, as you know, is a very close uh, professional relationship. Uh, another example, maybe not quite so, quite so precise, might be the relationship between orthopedic surgeons and physical therapists. They work quite closely together. But I think uh, now that uh, these results show that there clearly are physiologic differences in people who stutter, it, it does indicate that the world of medicine will be involved in this disorder. Okay, so. How does a disorder of cell metabolism explain stuttering? Uh, so the short answer is we don't know, but we have some ideas, which I'd like to tell you. And they're not very complicated ideas. We suggest that there is a specific group of nerve cells in the brain that are unique to speech production and also uniquely sensitive to this metabolic deficit. And the reason I have all these uniques in here is because We've given these people very extensive workups, and there's nothing else wrong with them except their speech. Okay, so it must be something very specific somewhere in the brain. And if you talk to the people in lysosomal storage disorders, and this is a great deal of medical expertise, they will tell you, oh, this is exactly what you would expect. That the, the, the lysosomal storage disorders are caused because the lysosomes can't do their job. They sort of begin degrading something that needs to be degraded, but they can't finish the job. And so the, the sort of a, it, the, the incomplete product just sort of builds up. And the lysosomes become hugely swollen. For instance, mucolipidosis 2 used to be called eye cell disease, inclusion cell. And you can just look through the microscope at these cells from these patients and see these enormous things. They're called inclusions inside the cells. And what they are are these swollen lysosomes that are filled with things that just can't be processed by the cell because of this metabolic defect. But the general rule in the medical aspects of these disorders is that they have very quirky and variable uh, symptoms. So two closely related disorders might, uh, in terms of their genetics, or what's wrong with the enzymes in the lysosome might have very different medical disorders. One might predominantly affect the brain, and another might predominantly affect the bones, or something like this. Okay, so uh, what I would say, um, quirky and unexpected presentation of the affected cells is almost the rule for this class of disorders. And it appears as if uh, this set of disorders, this group, this modest group of people who stutter, are going to lead us to some cells that are very important not only for speech uh, and fluency, but normal speech in all of us. Okay? So what is our goal? Our goal is to identify these cells, discover what these cells do, determine what they're connected to, because the brain, of course, is an extremely complex network of connections. Uh, and understand how this inherited deficit uniquely affects them, okay? So, do we have any hints? Uh, so, uh, the short answer is, well, not really, but maybe a little. Um, one way you might attack this question of finding these cells is cells that are sensitive to a particular mutation typically are the ones that need that gene product the most. So what you do is you go through all the tissues of the body, or in this case of the brain, and you look for the ones that normally make the most of it. Call this is called gene expression studies. What express this gene the most? So are there any gene expression studies for these three genes in, in, at high resolution that would allow us to tell different cell types uh, apart in the brain? And uh, there is something called the Allen Brain Atlas. It was funded by uh, Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft Corporation. Uh, and they've gone through the mouse brain, can't do this thing with humans, but uh, they've gone through the mouse brain and measured the expression of every gene, 
all 25,000 genes in the mouse, the pattern of expression in the mouse brain. Well, not quite. Uh, GNPTAB is not in the Allen Brain Atlas. And the uncovering enzyme is there, and it has uniform, very low levels of expression in every cell in the brain. It's just not very informative. However, GNPTG uh, is a little different. So this is a section of the mouse brain. This is a section uh, cut this way, and it's about halfway in between the middle of the mouse brain and the outside edge. And these little, these red sort of circular structures here, you can ignore these. These are artifacts of preparation. These are the posts that the slide sat on. Uh, but uh, this is the cerebellum, which is, uh, control, uh, controls uh, motion, motor function. And in humans, the cerebellum is sort of back, tucked back underneath, back here. In the mouse, which kind of has his brain sort of more stretched out, it's out here, st sticking out behind. Uh, and the way these things are read is, uh, blue is the lowest level of expression, uh, medium level is green, uh, yellow is high expression, and red is very high level of expression. What you see is there's this sort of structure here that's yellow or a part of it is even red. Uh, this is called the hippocampus. Okay? It's actually named, uh, early anatomists named it. Uh, hippocamp is the Greek word for seahorse, and they, they thought, early anatomists thought this looked like a seahorse. It kind of does. Uh, uh, what does the hippocampus do? Well. Uh, this is a great surprise for anything having to do with speech. Uh, the hippocampus is, is an evolutionarily ancient part of the brain, and it's involved in lots and lots of things. Uh, it's involved in memory, and it's involved in, in emotion, um, and some other things. Well, I think it's fairly clear that people who stuttered are not generally characterized by deficits in memory. Uh, however, if you ask people who stutter what causes their stuttering, you'll very frequently hear people refer to emotional factors. So there's a possibility that these cells might actually be the connection between emotional factors and fluency uh, in this disorder. But as I say, it's completely speculative at this point. So um, the last thing I'd like to touch on is uh, this is, a, we feel, an exciting opening into our understanding of this disorder at the basic level, uh, but it doesn't explain all that much of it yet. Uh, we want the rest. So is it likely that we're going to be able to get the rest of it? Well, I'll just show you. Um, we have done additional ascertainment in Pakistan, and we uh, are not finding any more families like the one I showed you previously, but we're finding families like this, a somewhat simpler family. Uh, only about a half a dozen affected individuals in this family, uh, and three inbreeding loops here. Um, however, these families have a great deal of power for genetic studies. And this is new. It's all unpublished. But I'll just show you uh, the results. This is the results of, of testing markers. Here's all the markers down the length of the chromosome 1. Here's the markers down the length of chromosome 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on down the line. Uh, this is a statistical score here on this axis. Uh, and it represents the statistical proof that you have linkage that some marker on some chromosome is linked to the disease in that family. And the magic number is three. Okay, this is called a LOD score. It stands for logarithm of the odds. So 10 to the third is a thousandfold. It's a, in other words, statistically, it's a thousandfold more likely that, that we have linkage than just random noise. Okay? Uh, and there's a number of theoretical reasons for picking a LOD score of three as proof of linkage. Uh, but in practical terms, a lot square of three is essentially never overturned. Uh, and you see this, this very nice, lovely signal right here on chromosome three. And nothing, interestingly, here on chromosome 12. All right? Uh, so it's clear we have a new stuttering gene, and uh, we think we can probably find this gene. We don't know what it will be. Uh, we don't know what it will tell us, but we think we can find it. So uh, I just need to finish by thanking a very large number of people. What I have sort of uh, uh, just glossed over in my talk is really, I will have to say, heroic efforts by a large number of people. This could not have been done without a great sort of weight pushing behind me. And I really need to thank a number of people in my laboratory, in other institutes at the National Institutes of Health, uh, at the NIH Clinical Center, uh, the National Center for Biotechnology Information, uh, sources, many sources of individuals who stutter, our collaborators in Pakistan, and of course, stuttering research subjects worldwide. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. It's, um, I, I, will, I will say, um, uh, I've been a human geneticist for 35 years. I'm older than I look. Uh, I also act younger than I am. Uh, I've been a, a working human geneticist for 35 years. We have, I have had the privilege to be involved in many, many very important human genetics projects. Uh, I've never been involved in anything like this. Um, I should just, just to put this into perspective, so this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's the most highly cited scientific journal in the world. Um, fewer than 1% of the papers submitted to the New England Journal are ever accepted for ultimate publication. Um, the, um, the, the most famous uh, general scientific journals in the world are a British journal called Nature, an American journal called Science, and another journal that's sort of a biological journal called Cell. Uh, so these journals all have uh, acceptance rates down around low single digits. Uh, they're all extremely prominent uh, uh, journals. Um, in addition to a publication of our results in the New England Journal, uh, we were uh, fortunate to have an editorial written by Simon Fisher at uh, Oxford, who is, of course, a uh, very prominent and talented person in this, in this business. Um, and we were uh, 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 given commentaries in science, nature, and cell. Uh, I've actually never heard of a paper that got commentaries in science, nature, and cell at the same time. I've never heard of such a thing. So uh, it is, uh, uh, needless to say, uh, extremely satisfying uh, to have come really through a fairly epic road. I, I came to the NIH 13 and a half years ago uh, with the purpose of finding genes for stuttering. Uh, this could have never been done outside the NIH. We would have gotten our first grant. Grants last for three years. They give you three years of funding. We would have gotten our first grant. We never would have gotten our second grant. <laughs> uh, so. Um, I think it is, uh, it, it is interesting, not only, I think, very compelling from, a, from the aspect of a clinical disorder, a, a, a misunderstood, underappreciated, underserved need, all the way to the level of, of you know, systems evolution. I mean, why, why did we get this set of neurons, and how did we get them, right? So, and, and everything from biochemistry, uh, to uh, neuroanatomy, uh, to, uh, to psychology, really. And so I think it's, um, it's clear that uh, we've now jumped off the deep end of the pool. <laughs> uh, so we're going to paddle as hard as we can. Thank you. Here are several Stuttering Foundation publications.